Hey pals, as we record this, it is July 3rd, 2021, and we live in this little teeny town that borders both a U.S. military base and a Native American reservation that makes it so that all fireworks are 100% legal on the reservation. So, while you're listening to this episode, you are probably going to hear some fireworks in the background. Because for those of you that live in western Washington, you know what I'm talking about, which is we are known for lighting up the night sky. And that's exactly what's happening. Started about three days ago and will go on for about six more days. All the fireworks, all the time. So you're probably going to hear some of them in the background. After you listen to this episode and you hear some wicked fireworks outside, go to the website, sign up for our newsletter. Go to GoWithTheHeat.com. You can go find the link to the newsletter or go to gwth.us slash newsletter. You will find a way to subscribe to our newsletter. And in that newsletter is some amazing videos and information and additional content around our last episode for Tiger Claws. And if you subscribe now, you will get our additional information from Action Jackson, which I'm not going to give any spoilers. So just go sign up for that newsletter. All right, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. This week, we are talking about a class, an ultimate classic in action movies, in 80s action movies, with who might be the sexiest man in this season of the podcast. <laughs> Nothing against you, JCVD, but we, we're talking about a real man in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> sexiest man and woman. Give yes, my Canadian true. goddess some some love here. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> sexiest woman for sure. <laughs> we are speaking, of course, of the fantastic action movie Action Jackson, which originally premiered on February twelfth, nineteen eighty eight. It is directed by Craig R. Baxley. Now, Baxley is a longtime stun coordinator. Did some work on Police Story, Roots, Mash, Dukes of Hazard, The A Team. The Warriors, Ooh. we've seen this man doing stunts in a lot of the movies that we've watched. He didn't direct many movies, except for one little film called Stone Cold. Of course! <laughs> oh my god, it makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> makes so much sense, It's yes. the same story, just with a white guy. <laughs> He's suspended, they like demote him. It's, oh my god, he just did the same story. He Is didn't it, change it. So wait, what does he have about football players? Oh, true story. I mean, they are yeah. beefy. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Like the beefiness. <laughs> yeah, because they're mean, both. Yeah, they're both football players. Obviously, yeah. Stone Cold. We're talking about the Boz. Well, we might be onto something here because it is written by Robert Renault, who doesn't have a Wikipedia. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm not, I mean, I'm not throwing anything out. I'm not saying anything for concrete. But you know, it's just that there's two of the same movies, and it's written by a guy who's got no Wikipedia. We have to take a moment to mention the producer here. We do this occasionally. When is the right person? Last movie we talked about someone that had done a or in Alienation we talked about someone who had been really deep in sci-fi movies. Lots of important work in sci-fi movies. This week. We have to mention that the producer is Joel motherfucking Silver. Because he did everything in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> he left nothing untouched. <laughs> there must have been a stamp with his name on it. And just yeah. every movie that came through, they just stamped his name on there. <laughs> if you love action movies, you have seen at least... 12 Joel Silver movies. I mean, that's all he does, right? <laughs> I mean, our last season of the podcast was basically the Joel <laughs> Silver season. <laughs> and of course, there's a great Joel Silver story with this movie. Is that Joel Silver, also the producer on Predator, speaking with Carl Weathers, the star of Action Jackson and the sexiest, sexiest man alive. <laughs> and he says, we should do a movie together. And Carl Weathers goes, yeah, absolutely. He's like, you think of some ideas? And later, Carl Weathers comes back to him. He's like, I don't know. How about something like Action Jackson? <laughs> Silver's like, that's great. I'll get a writer on it. <laughs> and Action Jackson was born. And uh, not to spoil our guest stars, but I swear it must have gone like this. Like, hey, let's do this movie. I think they're filming The Goonies next door. Hey, guys, come on. Let's film a movie. <laughs> What's that? They're filming Lethal Weapon down the way? Hey, everybody, come be in our movie, too. Now, this was an obvious choice why we chose this movie to be in this season. Action Jackson is 
one of the quintessential 80s action movies. And I don't want to get too far into my final thoughts here, but it's one of the few ones that is able to do a little bit of comedy in it, and it's not too corny. Action movies and comedy, it, it gets off into a weird area. I think you're talking about the, the comedy in Tango and Cash. Let's be honest. The, ta- the comedy in that is not that funny. And it's mostly coming from Sly. So <laughs> I think of all the movies that we've done, this movie has the best deaths of any movie. They must have set like eight stunt guys on fire at one point or another during this movie. Like, it's fantastic. And for no reason. Like, they would shoot a guy and he'd burst into flames. It's just great. <laughs> it has all of the 80s stuff, too. There's the evil corporation. Yeah. There's unions. Mm-hmm. There's street gangs. There's the pseudo ninja people. Yes. They're, they're, you have to have ninjas. You can't have an 80s movie without trained ninjas. Trained assassins is what they yeah, are. That, too. And talk about it a lot throughout this episode. But they, they really match the era of our hair bands. So I kept thinking, like, is that rat? No, I mean, it must be poison. Poison, that's who's in this movie. <laughs> Checks all of the boxes for being a great action movie. And then, on top of that, it has an unreal cast. Especially for an action movie, when you consider some of it is people who have already been in a lot of movies and they're already famous. And then there's people who are going to be action people going forward. That make their appearance, their first appearances or early appearances in this movie too. It's this great nexus of a whole bunch of what would be like maybe second tier stars that end up being really big stars. When I was just going through the guest stars, getting everything set up, it was just like one after another. Like, oh hey, oh I know that guy. Oh I know that guy. It's just nonstop. And that's why you know, it was an easy pick, even though we debated it a little bit in our preseason setup. We debated whether or not to include this movie. I think no matter what, this gets included in great 80s action. We just had a debate on whether or not it fit our theme. But no doubt, this is great 80s action. This is as good as it gets. And, I mean, I think it does fit the theme. In fact, he almost has three partners. At the end, the bodyguard just shows up and starts... I would watch a movie just about the bodyguard, honestly. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, before we get into our rundown, we do want to stop and talk about these guest stars because there's so many. There's there's some Vice connections. There's other 80s action movie connections. It's it's just so deep. John, I want to turn it over to you here really early because we've got to talk about these guest stars. We've got to get started with the lead, and that's Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers, he's an actor and former football player, and actually I had his football card. He played for the Oakland Raiders back in 70 and 71 and then uh moved to the canadian league and played for the bc lions until 73 he got started as an extra in black exploitation movies and eventually became what everyone knows him as apollo creed in the rocky movies after the rocky movies he would do predator he would do this movie more recently he was in happy gilmore and he's shown up on the mandalorian he is awesome And he is a big, massive dude with just yoked out in this movie. If you're on Twitter, you've got to follow Carl Weathers because it is the most wholesome Twitter account that you will follow. He loves every single person that tweets at him, including Melissa, who has tweeted at Carl Weathers. And and uh, you have, too, and he liked one of your tweets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because he's in The Mandalorian, he is all hyped on the Star Wars stuff. All he does is talk about Baby Yoda doing the hand thing. So (laughs) (laughs) Do the hand thing, baby. (laughs) Anytime we hear that Carl Weathers is going to be in a thing, we're like, okay, so what's the thing? Yeah, what is it? Let's watch watch it. And he's in the best stuff, man. Predator, Rocky. He's in some of the best stuff. Arrested Development? Come on. Yeah. He's making a stew. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think the only bad thing he was ever in was was the Oakland Raiders. Ha ha ha. So our next guest star is Craig T. Nelson. He played Coach on the TV show Coach. He also plays Peter Delaplane in this movie. His Wikipedia claims that he is an actor and stand-up comedian. Have you guys ever heard Craig T. Nelson (laughs) talk stand-up? No. No. (laughs) I have not either. Well, I mean, I think he's supposed to be a now. comedian when he did Coach. It was because he was a comedian at some point. That's how he got... I didn't assume that's how... he was the comedian. Yeah, I, but I Tim assumed, Allen uh... used to be a comedian, too. So, come on. <laughs> yeah, but he also used to do a ton of cocaine. So, yeah, like, well... that makes more sense. 
Maybe Craig T. Nelson did too. <laughs> Craig T. Nelson was also in movies Stir Crazy, Turner and Hooch, and The Devil's Advocate. So maybe he is a comedian. He's also the voice of Mr. Incredible. That's what so, we know him as. <laughs> yeah, that's what probably most people know him as now. I didn't realize he was in Stir Crazy. Yeah, so. the only thing I ever think of when it comes to Craig T. Nelson is Coach and Poltergeist. He was yeah. in Parenthood too, the show. So that's what I always think of him as. Our next guest star is the beautiful and talented Vanity. Now guys, I've talked about Vanity all the time. She's the Canadian singer, model, dancer, actress, Denise Matthews. She was given the name Vanity by Prince when she was chosen to be the lead singer of Vanity 6. She would go on to have a successful solo career, and then she would leave music to become an evangelist before her death in 2016. If you want to read something interesting, her last marriage was to a guy named Anthony Smith, who was also an Oakland Raider. And she sought him out after he did some charity, thinking, oh, he's such a nice guy. They had a really abusive relationship, and it turns out he murdered three people. That's a whole TV movie in its own. All right, moving on. We have Sharon Stone, who you guys would know from Basic Instinct, Casino, Quick and the Dead, Total Recall. She's an actress, model, sex symbol. Everyone knows the scene from Basic Instinct when she does the leg thing. So, I could go on and on forever. There's so many guest stars in this movie. I mean, Bill Duke, who was also in Commando and Predator with Carl Weathers. He's in the movie. Robert Davies in the movie. He was in Die Hard and The Goonies. He was in The Goonies with Mary Ellen Trainer, who's also in this movie, who was also in Lethal Weapon 2 and 3. So, and that could go on. Biff is in this movie from Back to the Future movies. Like, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, there's just a ton of guest stars, etc., etc. It is so stacked that Every scene that has more than just like the, the, the main characters, you're like, hey, who's that? And you have to go to IMDb or something like go scroll through like, aha, I knew it. That guy. <laughs> All right. So we got to get into the breakdown of this movie because there's so much to talk about. So many, so many different things happen from Paula being stripped down. Jumping out of windows, karate, Craig T. Nelson doing karate. We got to talk about this. In the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go break this one down. Okay, so this opening is fantastic because there's a ER person working with their boss, like a CEO, and they're trying to come up with the lamest, I'm sorry for your loss letter to, yeah. <laughs> to the union yeah. or someone at the union. Meanwhile, the scorpions are rappelling down into the, <laughs> into the office in the PR person, the secretary, then they switch from, hey, I want to write this, sorry, you, for your loss letter to let's now bang in this office he totally fails that because he immediately tries to put on some sports thing on the tv yeah she's like oh sports thanks <laughs> it's total sleazy boss and the sec 80 sexual harassment we're working late come on let's do the nasty and then ninjas show up out of nowhere and the part that gets me i'm not surprised by the sexual harassment from the boss I'm a little surprised about the ninjas, but that's the 80s. Why does the union guy have a Glock on him? Like, where did that come from? He's just packing heat while trying to bang the secretary? You think it's going to be this by the numbers, this team is going to break in. First, they do break in, and then they just punch that poor woman. That poor woman they just punched her. So <laughs> and it looks so realistic. You're like, oh my God, they punched her for real. She's Very dead. old trainers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're messing with him throughout the whole scene. Because like they could just easily kill him, but instead they're like toying with him. And then when they do kill him, they don't just kill him a little bit. They blow him out of a window <laughs> on fire. <laughs> They kill him a lot. <laughs> they slowly hunt him and then shoot him with an explosive round out of a shotgun and then ruin the brunch happening downstairs. <laughs> that wasn't a brunch, it was at night. <laughs> that was a buffet. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the credits. We find out, oh, we're in Detroit, so that's probably why he's Ah, got that a gun. makes sense. <laughs> Ninja well, now I know why he was packing. And Ninja smash through windows in Detroit all the time. <laughs> Yes. That's why they needed RoboCop. I mean, come on. So then we jump from there to a scene of a couple cops driving through the city. And they say one of my favorite lines. One guy's bragging about getting some tail. And the other cop goes, ain't been no pussy in your house since your mother helped you move in. 
And then he called it the House of Wax. I was dying. <laughs> I'm going to use that one. I mean, come on, it was Biff. It's true. It's totally true. <laughs> There's been nothing going on in that house. <laughs> They're watching Albert. Poor Albert. Poor Albert. He's Poor a kid. Albert. Yeah. He's through the whole movie, too, which is another thing that's great about this, is that Albert's just throughout the entire film, including the yes. end scene. He's in the critical part of the end scene of this movie. <laughs> They're following him. They finally do arrest him, and when they arrest him, they start talking to him about Action Jackson, who apparently... His father is Bigfoot, who yes. raped yes. his mom, and the guy will shoot his hand off to avoid the man. I just want to come back to Bigfoot raping his mom. Yeah, what that's, the hell? Yeah. <laughs> you would think he'd be hairier. In the writing room, when they're yeah. deciding that they're going to talk about how Bigfoot raped his mom. Um, what? Someone was holding on to that <laughs> for the yeah. right moment. Yeah, exactly. Like, what kind of jokes <laughs> could we make here? And the guy's just sitting in the corner. He's like, well. You could say. I have one, but it got me fired from my last job. <laughs> Throw it in there anyway. <laughs> What's weird is that this is the only real scene that has that, like, cornball music. That little womp womp kind of thing behind it. And then, like, you don't hear it for the rest of the movie. So then they bring Bring Albert in after scaring the bejesus out of him for who he's going to speak with. And then they just uncuff him and ask a woman to give them a hand job in the precinct. Yeah, they're not professional cops at all. She's very <laughs> upset. <laughs> and she kicks him in the crotch. And then Albert takes off running. And nobody can stop him. All these cops are just like <laughs> letting him go by. It's the most packed precinct you've ever seen. The police station is full of people and they're all just like, Oh, papers flying everywhere. They've never seen someone run before. Good thing he <laughs> well, ran into Action Jackson's desk, because otherwise he would have just ran right out the door. <laughs> Action Jackson stopped him because he's a former Raiders linebacker. He's the only one capable of tackling him. <laughs> he wasn't at his desk. No, he wasn't at his desk. Yes, right, yeah. <laughs> Aside from the police and their inability to be able to tackle Albert inside of the precinct, I have two other thoughts. One is, man, there's a lot of Tina Turners in this place. Yeah, what is going on? <laughs> and then just more thoughts about the 80s and cops and about how we've had a string of movies now where there's cops in it, and they treat people Really, really horrendously. And yet, there's never any repercussions for those cops. Well, I have news for you. That mm. still goes on. That doesn't just, even any different. <laughs> just observation. Man, they have a high opinion of these lead cops. He's a track star, Harvard Law degree. The backstory on some of these guys. So he's like super rich, black belt, highly trained martial artist. But he decides to be a street cop. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so now, partner, his former partner, and Action Jackson need to go talk to their chief. Chief Armbrust. It's a great name. It's a great name. Not only is it a great name, but it's a great name for Bill Duke. Yeah, because when you look at him, he's like, he is an arm bruster. That's him right there. I'm pretty sure he's still playing the same character from Predator. He's just had a job now. <laughs> Which is the same character in Vice. Different story, though. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Partner goes in there and gives a rundown on what happened with this PR person and the CEO. CEO's name is Stringer. He was there to give her the old protein pickup, which Armbruster doesn't like the language. And he says he didn't mm. give her the old. He, what he says is that he doesn't think they were having an affair because he didn't give her the old protein injection. He did not appreciate that and thought it was a very inappropriate statement to make. <laughs> <laughs> then... Jackson comes in and we find out why he is on the shit list. My biggest takeaway on this, obviously, is all the stuff that John mentioned. Trackstar, Harvard Law Degree, all this stuff. A, he wants them to go see Peter Delaplane get an award, even though there's a serious problem with those two, including that Jackson put his son in prison. But two, mm -hmm. is that Jackson is not allowed to carry a gun. He's still able to be a cop, and he just operates as a cop without a gun. And I really appreciate that this story sticks with it until the very last scene. He operates this whole movie without ever having a gun. Yeah, he's like, I don't have a gun. I can't shoot him. And she's like, what do you mean? Why don't you have a gun? <laughs> they just keep mentioning that he lost his stripes because apparently he went too far with the rich guy's kid when he arrested them. I had police brutality suit came up, but they never say how far they busted them down. For all we know, he's a traffic cop. Like, he's supposed to be in one of them little buggies handing out parking tickets somewhere, and yet he's investigating Peter Delaplane. Yeah, he's supposed to do administrative stuff. That's what he does. They say in that meeting, he says that you are specifically, your job is to do administrative and do community outreach things. So that's why he sends him, because he's like an ambassador for the precinct. Okay, that makes more sense. I missed that part, that he's supposed to be like an ambassador for, yeah. for the police. And 
the reason why he got his, he broke Peter Delaplane's son's arm, almost ripped it off of his body while he was arresting him. Well, I mean, his dad was big for it. I mean, he's just got that extra <laughs> strength. Now, it also makes sense why they use him in cases like Albert, who is having a hard time keeping his consciousness now that he knows he's <laughs> going to have to deal with Jackson. Yeah, yeah. Every time he sees him, he goes, oh, yes. and he falls over. And he does like the comically, he passes out comically where, you know, your eyes roll back in your head and then your head goes around like in circles a couple times and then you fall down it, uh, through two doors of plexiglass. It's like <laughs> way far away. <laughs> Oh my god, oh, and he falls over. <laughs> he gave me a very Izzy vibe. Yeah, he does kind of have an Izzy vibe. <laughs> or uh, the Nook Man. Oh, the Nook yeah. Man. We miss Nook Nook Man. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I miss Izzy. So now Jackson's got to go see Peter Delaplane get this award. He's watching from the kitchen. Patrice comes up, starts talking to him. He starts telling her that he hates Peter Delaplane. He doesn't mind being all the way back here, and that guy's an ass. And then Patrice gets invited up on stage to go stand next to her husband, who's Peter Delaplane. Yeah, she says, I could, I could change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but the more important scene that we're trying to get to here is the yacht, where there's some real good meatballs that are trying to protect themselves from poison. Yeah, oh, doing a good... Bon Jovi, Death Leopard. Death that, Leopard. Death <laughs> Leopard, that's who's attacking. attack. The attack is great, too, because the thugs come in and they handcuff a bomb to the meatball. Who doesn't try to escape either. He just sees it and starts screaming. <laughs> yeah, he tries to get it off. Like, thinking he can, like, claw off the handcuff or something. <laughs> Dude, I mean, they're killing people in all kinds of ways. They killed someone with an arrow. They got someone with a knife. Like, they're just mixing it up, having fun. These ninjas are awesome. <laughs> at Jackson's house, Clovis, between driving limos and getting stuck at the Nakatomi Tower. <laughs> <laughs> also parks cars at apartment complex all the way in Detroit, Detroit. <laughs> basically the same job think about it he just drives your car for you <laughs> after everything at Nakatomi Plaza I mean you wouldn't blame him for moving yeah he's like I gotta get out of here I gotta go do that where it's, it's less dangerous in Detroit <laughs> god man moving from LA to Detroit Woo. <laughs> when Jackson gets into his place he sees an ad for the new Haley or Halley car which is a Delaplane car Port's gonna come up again later in this movie about it. it's mm -hmm. hot, hot, hotter. Yeah, exactly. But, okay, let's get over the fact that there's a car company named Delaplane. I would never buy a car from that company. <laughs> that was the stupidest commercial that's ever been made. It flies away. Yeah. The Canyon Arrow was a better commercial <laughs> than that. <laughs> this is the most obvious criminal organization. They are murdering all of the union guys that Peter Delaplane doesn't like. Literally making it obvious that he's just murdering all of his enemies. So at the same time as he's watching the news and he sees the explosion that happened on the yacht, he's also listening to his answering machine with a message from his friend, Tony, who says it's a matter of life and death. But instead of calling Tony back, he just runs straight down to the precinct to find out what's happening from the explosion. Then while he's at the precinct, he then finally takes a call from Tony. Again, it's a matter of life and death. So he goes over to go see Tony. Sorry, I had a burp. He sees his old friend, Tony, who, guess what? Works for the union. And he's all paranoid. He's worried that something's going to happen. He tells him, Peter Delaplane's going to kill me. And Action Jackson goes, all right, I'll see you later, Tony. And leaves and lets him die. He even holds the door for the killer. <laughs> That's the thing that bugged me the most about the Tony stuff is that he was still he's ripping his place apart, but he still wouldn't lock his front door. And yeah, you would think I mean, that he would have like 95 locks on his front door. Yeah, the delivery guy opened his door on his own, right? So why didn't he try to run right away? Like some stranger just opened your door. But to Yeah, be he fair, just stands there. Yeah, but to be fair to action, Tony had nothing to go on. He was like, I have all this information. He's like, okay, but why is he killing the people? He's like, I don't know. I can't put it together. Like, listen, I really don't know the reason why he's killing these people, but his mistress mm. might know. So go to her. She like works at some club. She's a lounge singer. Go to her. But so he had nothing to go on. So of course he's going to be like, okay, so maybe also maybe Tony's a little paranoid and sweaty. Maybe he does drugs. Who knows? <laughs> he lives in that crap hole of an apartment. He's crazy. Who knows? <laughs> all he knows is that Norman, Grantham and Stringer are all dead. They're all associated with the union and like, or the competition. That's all he knows mm -hmm. is that there's all these people are dead. He works for those people or yeah. for Stringer helping get information. Tony should have known something was up when the guy opened the door and it wasn't UPS. It was AHF or something. I thought that too. <laughs> I was like, well, they can't use UPS in this. They got brown, got brown clothes, but it was like some random. <laughs> At the 
same time, at Joey's club, Vanity is practicing with her band, and Peter Delaplane is watching. He's the only one watching, and he owns, he's got to be the owner of the club, right? That's like why I don't saying. know. Mm-hmm. He's the creep of the club. <laughs> That's what he is. There's two fantastic things that we have to talk about in this scene. The bouncer checks in with, even though that Peter Delaplane pays his paycheck, is the owner of the club, the bouncer's Ask her if she would like him to escort her away from Peter Delphine. I think it's her it's her personal bodyguard. So yes, even though he pays his check, he was like, Hey, do you want me to go with you? Do you need me? And she's like, No, I'm okay. Then Peter doesn't like that. And he's like, You need to remember who pays your checks. And he's like, Of course I'm you graciously pay my checks. I know. Obviously he doesn't like Peter and it's it's obvious he don't care who he works for, who pays him. He's going to protect her. Yeah. The bouncer is a great character. He talks about how nonviolent, mm-hmm. and he, he's a Muslim, and she's an all-around nice guy. Oh, yeah. He's a nice guy. <laughs> Except for when it comes to her, he's going to protect her. Now let's get to the real sticking point in this scene. And for the entire movie that we all know is the most unbelievable aspect. Craig T. Nelson's getting vanity and Sharon Stone. No way. Get out of here. Way. Come on. Yeah. I know. Way. Now, no. to be fair, Vanity does say, oh, you told me that I was going to get a record executive was going to come listen to me. You told me that I was going to get discovered. I was going to get a record deal. When is that going to happen? You told me, basically, he told her all these lies. And she asked, mm-hmm. like, oh, have you told your wife about me? And he's like, oh, why would I do that? And she's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe, basically, like, maybe someone should tell her about me. And then he pulls out his drugs. <laughs> so back at Tony's, that's when we finish up. We know that Shringer, Norman, and Grantham all hate Delaplane, but now they're all dead. Tony promises he's on to something. He needs action, Jackson. Tony says, take action. Not afraid of anyone. Then just leaves the front door open. Tony gets killed. (laughs) Then we also had what we were talking about with Sydney. She's reminding Delaplane of all the stuff he had promised her, but then of of drugs. Mm -hmm. Later, and then we get a really weird scene where Jackson basically just shows up to tell Delaplane that he's investigating him again. That was an interesting scene because he comes in and just lays the threat. Right, that's like all that he's doing. I think that was to get to the wife though. Because mm. he goes in there, he lays the thread out, and then he tells her, he lays it on real thick with her. Like, I'm so sorry to have interrupted and ruined your lunch. Because he says later on, he says, like, I think I can get in with beautiful wife. I think I can get in with her. And because he knows right away, because they, they talked and they kind of flirted and she had some kind of rapport with him. He thinks he can get in with her. So I mm. think that was part of it. He was going to go there and show her. Like, hey, look at all this stuff that your husband is doing. She really had no idea. And then she, yeah. then it did. It, it, it worked. But it spurred her to be nosy and to listen in on conversations that she really had no part of. So the next scene, we're at Delaplane's. And first of all, we start off with proper entry for when you come into the gangster slash gang leader house that he's beating the fuck out of one of his own people. Yeah. <laughs> I think that having a practice fight. Yep. But Delaplane's a cheater. It's clearly <laughs> someone else that other guy brought in for him so that he could train as a sparring partner. But he's supposed to be sparring him, not kicking the crap out of him. And also, he's a cheater. He waits till that guy turns his back and then punches, sucker punches him. And then after he beats him up, he's like, get him out of here. He even does it with it. They have, they get too heated, right? Yeah. Punch the back of the head. Things get really heated. They start fighting. Guy goes down. They stop. He's like, okay. Puts his hand out like, help me up. It got a little heated, but it's okay. Delphine grabs his arm and then shatters it. Because that's Coach. Can you believe it? That was Coach doing that. <laughs> Where's oh, Dauber God, at thank... when you need him? <laughs> oh, I was going to say, thank God he never broke Dauber's arm. I know. Poor Dauber. He's such a gem. <laughs> See, I believe he was a comedian. Yeah, of course. He's Patrick. <laughs> the sea star. Of course yeah. he's a... <laughs> Meanwhile, in the sauna, Patrice is having some quality me time. You know, just her. In there, mm-hmm. you what you do alone in a sauna? Sweat. <laughs> and then she eavesdrops on the dumbest criminal ever, who's loudly <laughs> explaining all of their criminal enterprises. <laughs> he explains he everything that happened. Yeah, we killed this person for that. This we this person, but this other person saw it happen. Jackson saw, it, so we couldn't get to him in time. And just in the middle of the hallway, someone yeah. at the airport who's speaking on their phone on speaker. <laughs> And he's, like, giving out details, like, oh, we shot him with this, and then we got him like that, and, yeah, oh, just the dumbest criminal ever. 
<laughs> Patrice gets dressed, quickly tries to leave while the security detail tries to stop her. Yeah, don't do you, you want me to drive to... you? Yeah, she's like, no, I don't want you to drive me. And luckily enough, she throws open the door, and who's standing on the other side of the door but Action Jack? Get in that car, girl, and you drive. No, <laughs> <laughs> You're married to Craig T. Nelson, and Action Jackson picked you up. Uh, you leave. Bye. No, <laughs> we all saw him with his shirt off. <laughs> You go in that car and you don't look back. <laughs> they go to lunch. I don't know if it was lunch. I think it was more just a drink. <laughs> in a seedy little bar downtown. She talks about what she heard. She talks about that they're trying to get to O'Rooney. She lays it all out. Just gives Jackson all of the detail that he needs to be able to get started on this investigation. And then as they're leaving, they almost get run down by a cab. And my favorite part... He runs down the cab. I I don't know how fast he is, but like I know the fastest players in the NFL sometimes get up to about 20 miles an hour. So I'm just saying, man, he had to have gotten up above that. The man, the myth, the legend that is Action Jackson. He runs them down in a suit and loafers on the streets of Detroit. Then when invites the car to run him over and does a flip (laughs) over it. He was Which, a track oh, yeah. star, remember? He was a track star and called it. <laughs> he, he also punches the windshield out and grabs the steering wheel at one point. Like, oh my God. He's incredible. They use a Pinto as a ramp and then drives into a building. <laughs> I mean, on foot, without a gun, he takes on a man driving a car. Yep. Back. So the man driving the car made a big mistake. He should have just shot him. But he listened to action just talking smack to him. And decided to try and run him down. And he did the old flip over the car trick. And next thing you know, cars are exploding everywhere. And oh, it's just crazy. It was so great because he runs him down. I mean, we were talking about the man that ran on the beach for for hours with Sylvester. (laughs) In his short I'll just say, I think a cab that almost hit him and speeding away would be gone by the time he even started running. But I don't know. (laughs) Hey, this means that in that beach scene that he lets... Rocky win that race. One hundred percent. Rocky never <laughs> gets fast enough to be able 100%, to outrace him. One hundred percent. There was no way that Sylvester Stallone, with his face running like that, was able. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. When Carl Weathers is running, he ain't breaking a sweat. You can see it. So graceful, Gazelle. not yeah, like it, I mean, just, just <laughs> running in those short shorts and a half shirt. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with him. You, you, oh, no. I know. Then I, you see Sly and his face like wrinkled and grimaced in pain. I can't believe the Raiders cut him after seven games. That's ridiculous. That's why I the didn't Raiders see him still in suck. Short shorts and a half shirt. Did you see down that cab? Come on. <laughs> Come on. A mystery. How did the ninja escape? He drove, flipped the car over into a building, and he was gone 30 seconds later. He's a ninja. Don't you understand? (laughs) I don't know. I need a vanity music video break. (laughs) Well, real fast, at the precinct, Jackson shows up there, gets a note from Patrice, and the note is that she's going to go tell Peter what's going on. But she's convinced that Peter is clean. It's her It's he doesn't his know. security detail. Yeah, she thinks he stuff. doesn't know. So she's going to come clean with him and tell him all the stuff. So cause she feel, I think she feels guilty because she was like, because she was out having a drink with another hot, sexy man. And <laughs> it wasn't her husband. Poor, and she didn't get him arrested. <laughs> poor, poor, dumb Sharon Stone. I know, Patrice. Why are you such a dummy? But the question I have for the group here is about Armbruster. When he gets that call and he's like, what? And he slams the phone down and he comes looking for Jackson. What was that phone call about? It says in the beginning of that scene, well, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. What? Why do you look like that? What happened? He's like, oh, I, you know, whatever. I, I wrinkled my suit or something. And then he, in the background, someone says, hey, Rooney's on the phone for you. So he goes and gets it. So that's what it was about. It was about him interrupting that dinner because that lunch, because he went there with those pictures. And, and that's why he doesn't know anything about the street or any of that yet. Because he interrupted the lunch when he went there with the pictures of the dead guys and was like, hey, look at this, look at that. That's the part I didn't hear was that they said, oh, Rooney was the one that was on the phone. The secretary guy who hands him message from Sharon Stowe. He's like, I didn't dream her. She was a beautiful vision. Well, how do you keep getting these women? He talks about his suits and stuff. And he's like, oh, Oh, here, by the way, Rooney's on the phone for you. Whatever, so-and-so Rooney is on the phone for you. And that's when Action Jackson's like, uh-oh. And he, take, he take, makes like a weird look on his face, and he takes off. Okay, that makes more sense, because I thought it was going to be about the car wreck. And I'm like, they tried to kill him. No, yeah, it's not about the car wreck. Yeah. Because 
the cops don't they don't even show up and he leaves before they even get there. So they wouldn't they don't even know he's involved in that. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the full music video of Vanity singing to Action Jackson, who, by the way, is really into Yeah, I mean he he looks like he wants to get up and dance. Like <laughs> He's laughing, he's smiling, he's like practically winking. He's like, oh yeah, this is good. And he forgets he's there as a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Patrice tells her husband everything and gets murdered by him. And the whole time I'm thinking like, how's he going to get away with Fred? Now he's murdering all of his business competition. Now he clearly murders his wife. How is he going to keep getting away with all of this? But I guess the trick is to just move the dead body into a black man's living room. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, mean, I guess. I guess. <laughs> that way. <laughs> the cops well, aren't going to do uh, any additional investigation at that even, point. Even if the black man happens yeah. to be a police officer, a decorated police officer. They're like mm-hmm. he did lose his stripes. I mean, yes, and he did. He did lose his stripes because of Delaplane's son. So that's what they think, right? Because of that, he goes berserk and murders Delaplane's wife. Just murder Delaplane. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, you knew what was going to happen in the scene because Delaplane comes walking in, and Cartier. That's the name. I know that's the name of that guy. Says, "Here's your 357 Magnum, all clean, imported." I'm like, thanks. I'll give it a test later. I'm like, okay, Patrice is dead. Yeah, she's dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> poor, poor, dumb Patrice. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> back at Joey's club, Sydney is backstage looking for a needle. Jackson <laughs> confronts Ed, the bouncer, talks about, he's a nice guy. I don't do violence. Jackson's trying to punch his way through. It's like, you're wasting your time, man. You should just go. But then those linebacker skills come back. He remembers. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah he remembers he just trying to tackle him. Earl Campbell. So then he barges through, knocks out Ed. And the best part about it is that Vanny's like, wow, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You really wanted to see me, huh? <laughs> you must really like my set. <laughs> so Sydney and Jackson hit the streets then. They're going to go out and go travel around. They're going to talk. And I, and I like his style. He decides to take her to one of them type of hotels that charges hourly. <laughs> he tried to just go pick her up and take her back straight back to his place. But then he drove by and the police were doing their investigation on... Patrice. Yeah, I'm very confused about this whole thing. I mean, I understand he doesn't he's trying to question her. Like, he doesn't want her to know he's a cop, maybe, so he's going to take her back to his apartment. And do, but why did she just go with him? She's like, okay, cool, whatever. Let's go. So clearly, that's a thing she does. First, I drive at his house. There's cops there. He's like, oh, we don't want to go over there. He, he goes over there, listens to the radio, finds out that Patrice is dead. She's in his apartment. They're looking for him. Then she, he's like, well, let's go to your place. She's like, okay, sure, let's go to my place. So they go to her place, and they're there. And she, what, I, what I don't understand is why doesn't he tell her, hey, you're in danger right away? Because she's, like, over there trying to turn on all lights. She's trying to, like, eat food. She's going to put on the TV. And he's like, no, we shouldn't do that. And she's quiet, you know. She doesn't understand what's going on. So, of course, she's going to, like, go be, like, her normal-ass house. <laughs> I'm going to go in my house. And, I'm going to turn on my uh, lights, eat my food out of my refrigerator, because I don't think someone's going to blow me up. <laughs> and I think she's stoned, too, or she's supposed yes. to be stoned. Because yes, she's, she's, she's trying to act all stoned. See, he was going to get to that after the sex. Apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because what was he going to do? I'm very disappointed in you, Action. (laughs) What was he going to do to get this information, Jackson? Huh? What were you going to (laughs) do? How does she not get blowed up, though, when the phone explodes? Is it just a really poor bomb? Is that nightstand made out of steel? What the hell? The 1964 nightstand was built with a steel <laughs> plate in the bottom. <laughs> built to last. You know what? Our like, idea I, nightstands would just blow right up. You would just be dead. <laughs> I get he's supposed to dive and push her out of the way, but it's literally a bomb hooked to the phone. And as soon as she picks it up, it explodes. There's no diving out of the way of that. Also, when you see the explosion and you see him get on top of her, it, look, it looks like it hits him, really hits mm-hmm. him in the movie. Like, okay, but they're trying to blow up Carl Weathers. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that man alone. He's a gem. You can't blow him up. <laughs> <laughs> so then they go to the Hotel Hoover. They speak with Sable. Sable, great. I love Sable. Sable is <laughs> yeah. so great. And, He's- and- it's even better than he loves the Flintstones. <laughs> <laughs> He's hilarious, and he reminds me kind of of the coach from The Water Boy that you can't understand, because I only yeah. understood about half of what he was saying. <laughs> Subtitles were great for us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's like, Dino, come on, Dino, you better do it. Come on, you know you want him. And he does it, and he's like, oh, that's great, he did it. He did the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sable is great. He 
because he's a former trainer, had trained Jackson, yeah. too. He knows everyone on the street. He knows everything yeah. that's happening. He runs that hotel, including, like, he knows that there's a pusher upstairs. Tries to sneak in past yeah. action. Yeah. <laughs> then, when they're upstairs, one more time, Danny's like, hey, like, you can do this thing. Jackson, nope, you're going to bed. I'm going to bed. The next morning... Albert brings up breakfast, which is the second time now we've seen Albert just out on the street because at the bar scene with... He tries to go in uh, that Patrice. bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He comes in to bring mm-hmm. a tray of food and he's like, oh my God, you're Action Jackson. <laughs> and see, yeah. Sable said, don't worry, I'll have Einstein bring breakfast up <laughs> to you the next Einstein. morning. <laughs> Albert Einstein. Yeah. So Albert- let's talk about owning versus renting a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so he he mentions that Delaplane owns her. She ref- kind of says it's more like renting her. The, clearly, Action Jackson owns Albert, the room service guy, because he loses his mind every time he sees him. He just, <laughs> he's just in his head. He owns his car, which is left in very few pieces in the alley when they come out. And... He apparently is only renting his wallet, as it is no longer with him when it, <laughs> when it gets taken off of him. She makes a comment on the way out that he should be on the A-team, but clearly, probably he shouldn't, considering he couldn't protect his car, his wallet, or her. Yeah, don't insult Mr. T like that. He would keep his wallet and his car and protect his girl. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, and he'd have that guy's chain. Exactly. We do have a little bit of brevity here because Jackson is arguing with Sydney. They're arguing back and forth about what to do. And Jackson says, why would I ever need help from a junk? And that really hurt her. She was really hurt by that, that he called her a junkie. It comes Mm. up again and again, which is like, you need my help, don't you? You need my help, don't you? She's like desperate for someone to need her for something other than her body. Yeah, and he does mm-hmm. need her help. So <laughs> he uses her because, through the whole movie for, for help. <laughs> yeah, and she keeps saving his ass. First he goes trying to chase down some dude named Papa Doc, and not the one from 8 Mile. <laughs> and it, it, he ends up getting mixed up with a bunch of guys who keep people's balls in jars. I don't think that's someone you want to go messing around with. Listen, these guys are very, very excited to talk about balls. T- about, t- about touching balls, cutting balls, cupping balls. They are very, they have- very excited about touching balls. I mean, there's a whole scene where they talk about how he's lucky they're not basically raping him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what the hell is well, going the- on? <laughs> Anyone that has a collection of balls in jars is not yeah. to be trifled with. Nope. <laughs> And he doesn't understand what the hell's going on the whole time. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand. Are you just dance action? Come on. (laughs) (laughs) They are so excited to get to Jack's balls. But then Sydney comes in and rescues him, says that this is my crazy little brother, like legit insane. And then Jackson goes on the rampage about how Jesus sent him there. Maybe he did. (laughs) Maybe Jesus had balls too. And then he uses his Jesus powers to whoop everyone's ass. <laughs> but Vanity saved him because he was going to have his balls cut off if she had came in there and made up a story. And then so. as they leave, he calls her a junkie again, and it hurts just as much as the first time that after she helped him she saved his balls yeah she saved his balls and then he gets back to the hotel and sable's like hey dummy should have just asked me i would have told you that they keep balls in jars over there (laughs) and that he's dead his balls are down there in the jar (laughs) yeah so he sends him sends him to his hairstylist because she knows everybody she is fantastic by the way i love the she yeah. needs her own spinoff. Yeah, she needs her own like, yes. sitcom or I don't know, something. Let's get a movie of D and the Bodyguard. <laughs> D knows everything. And you know what? It's great. Really, really great for Jackson. Because up to this point, the storyline has gone nowhere. And the writers have done him no help. They back themselves into a corner. The no. movie's got to end in about <laughs> yes. 15 minutes. So, yes. Thank we- God. Thank God this smart talking woman showed up with all the information that you could ever want on all the backstory about everything, including that Delaplane killed his first wife and his first business partner. <laughs> in like 45 seconds, filled in all the gaps that were missing in the story up to this point. We were just out having fun for about 60 minutes. And yep. he's like, okay, yes. Let's, chop, chop. Let's, let's get, get this, this back done. on track. Exactly. <laughs> Here's what happened. Enzo was his partner, killed him, but he had this group called the Invisible Men. Invisible Men got 
got greedy. Delaplane Plain paid him off. Enzo killed his first wife. They would have killed Jackson too, but he got demoted so he wasn't a threat anymore. Also talks about Oh Rooney. <laughs> Thank Everybody. you, D. Everybody. You. Yeah. I mean, she might as well have been holding the script at that point. <laughs> <laughs> So now Jax is going to go back to the hotel. Sydney's gone. They go up to room 303. That's where Sable says the pusher is. In there, it's the man who apparently survived his attack with Predator. He actually didn't <laughs> die in that attack. Maybe he's unkillable because he took a massive amount of junk when Action stabs him with the heroin needle. And he just kind of laughs. <laughs> I think that guy in real life would do that too. <laughs> I mean, we've seen him in a lot of stuff. 48 hours. He was in, obviously, Predator. He's in this movie. We saw him in some well, other really bad movie we watched, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Action, being a uh, son of Bigfoot, hits him so hard, he doesn't just fall out the window. He goes out the window and into the next building. <laughs> you might say like, I've too. watched a lot of movies. I've never seen someone get knocked to the next building before. <laughs> We get the Benny Hill police scene. They jump out. Uh, Sydney and Jackson jump out the window on top of the convertible, and then they get in the police car and drive away. Now, if you know anything, that the best place to hide is inside of stolen police cars. I was going to say, like, and then they drive it around for hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No one notices it or looks for it. <laughs> When they're just driving around all over the place in it, and apparently that's not a big deal to take a, a, Detroit. They don't even notice stolen police cars anymore. So now they come up with this plan after he attempts to drive the car straight into a wall to kill Sydney. Finally- yeah, he wants Sydney to help him. He knows that Sydney can do it, but she's too afraid because she doesn't want to go on that double plane. Because she doesn't want to end up dead, you know? <laughs> He's trying to blow up her house. Yes, these invisible men seem to be pretty good at their job. Yeah. So what they're going to do is, is that the next setup that's supposed to happen, they're going to have Sydney go in and act like it's Della Plain that's sent and then have that guy come out to the docks and then talk to Jackson. That way they can get on the inside track of what's going to happen. Yeah, because they don't even really know why Della Plain's killing people yet. And all they know is that he's going to try to kill Rooney the next day, but they don't know, like what any any of the details or soon i don't know if they know if it's the next day at that point i think if they just went back and talked to d they would find (laughs) out (laughs) why he's trying to kill people so now this guy's great she goes in and gets him he's like "Ah, do i go do this right now yeah you have to go right now they go walking out this is your car oh this is a terrible car they drive man this is a long shot i can't believe we have to drive this far why is it so far away why Why is the way out here oh i walk up these stairs so many stairs why is this so hard you're like you're almost at the end of the scene like are you gonna kill this guy because he's got a miserable life he is miserable in life after all the complaining jackson makes a great entrance down a chain why did he do that he could have just been staying there when he opened the door no hold on wait a minute hey i'm up here he makes him look up. <laughs> it almost felt like his entire plan was to get him to go somewhere where he could slide down a chain. Like, Find that was his chain. whole plan. Yeah. yeah. Find me a chain I to think slide there's down. one at the docks. Go get him. Drive him across town. Make him go up three flights of stairs where this chain is, I know. And I'll slide down the chain and it'll look badass. Find out that they're going to kill O'Rooney at this party that Delaplane is putting on. For O'Rooney. <laughs> Sorry, we don't know that yet. All we know is that O'Rooney is going to be killed. And that Delaplane wants to do it because Delaplane wants to take over being the president of the AWA. No, so he wants to put the guy that comes to meet them, the guy they, 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 they drag out there to the long, that guy is who he's going to put in charge. He is going, they're going to kill O'Rooney and then they're going to put, that guy is going to be the president. So yes, he wants to be in charge of it, uh-huh. but not really be in charge of it. You know, smoke and mirrors like, yeah, so whatever that guy's name is, he's who's going to be the president. So then, well, when- he definitely doesn't want to be the president now that he saw the chain thing. <laughs> So then after he hears that, he comes out and the invisible warriors, whatever their name is. Whatever, those guys. <laughs> they're out there with Delaplane. Capture Sydney and Jackson. Take Jackson. Tie him up to some chains. Take his shirt off. I yeah, why did they do off. that? What is going on? Make sure he looks <laughs> I don't know. Grease him up. Like, <laughs> He's like all oh, sweaty. And <laughs> why do bad guys make the most elaborate ways to kill the good guys in these movies? Like they could have easily just shot him in the face and movie over. But no, they got to strap up, take his shirt off, oil him up, and strap him to chains. And then he's got to tell him his whole big plan and how he's going to go up 
and kill kill vanity and you know kick some dirt at him you know oh i'm gonna sleep with her first like just get it over with guys this scene is great the reason why it's so great is because we get del plane's full five-year vision yeah. on what he's doing <laughs> he points out a vision board he's like okay so here we go <laughs> step one is i'm gonna kill him but i'm gonna make it look like you because no one can tell you people apart oh uh, what <laughs> really <laughs> says that <laughs> Yes. Literally yes. says that exact line, lays out the entire thing that's going to happen with whatever happens with the union, what he's going to do politically, lays out everything. And this is great because up to this point, the story has failed to convey any Thank of you, this man. information, <laughs> sum it all up right in this scene right here because it's like they got to it. They're like, oh shit, you know what we haven't done? We haven't explained Delo Plain's motive. <laughs> plan or anything <laughs> we haven't done anything he just is maybe yes. we should have shit now we gotta do something about it <laughs> they're gonna burn jackson that way he's charred for the car crash frame up after he kills o'rooney but luckily big ed comes to the rescue and big ed puts his muslim ways aside to make sure he's oh, gonna yeah. take care of business so him and jackson are gonna murder all of the invisible men. Oh my god. And in the best ways possible. Guys are exploding on fire. Guys are being electrocuted. <laughs> oh, it is just awesomeness. Big Ed is the man. Yeah. Big Ed's man. Mm-hmm. We're not done with Big Ed. Because now we're going to go to no. Del Plain's party. Jackson so. is, that, is undercover. He doesn't stand out. Why is he not? He's not undercover. He's just walking around in a suit with everybody else. Do you not understand how this works, Jackson? (laughs) I don't care about any of that. He kills the hitman in the most ridiculous way possible. (laughs) He swings on Christmas lights that randomly explode, blowing the guy out of the tree and impaling him. (laughs) Big Ed, Albert, Sable... And his former partner are all there. They're all there to help in this, too. Well, his former partner's not really there to help. He's just there. And then it's not to the very <laughs> end that he's like, all right, fine, I'm helping. <laughs> his help is not doing anything. Yeah, he's not just not stopping it. <laughs> After they killed the assassin, uh, the partner saves Kid Sable and gives Jackson his gun. So, eh, I don't know, go for it. Cool, see you later. And it's great. Because Jackson literally drives the car through the hallway, up the stairs, down the upstairs hallway, <laughs> straight into the bedroom where Delaplane is not changing his plan. Oh, Rooney hasn't been assassinated, but he's still going to kill Sydney by overdosing her. Why didn't he run? <laughs> the plan went wrong. Everyone knew he was responsible for it because it all, all hell breaks loose. And the guy who he was supposed to put as president was like, Delaplane did it. <laughs> and then, He's like, screw it. I'm just going to go kill Sydney. Bye. And take off. Goes <laughs> upstairs. That, I think he thinks that's the, like, now that everything's gone to hell, that's the ultimate, that's the only way he can get back at Jackson, right? Is to kill Sydney. Mm-hmm. They go in, instead of a shootout, they're going to have a karate off. Because he yes. was kicking people's ass before in karate, so. <laughs> <laughs> but Apollo Creed don't play. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> After the Delaplane starts getting whooped, they both go for their guns, but Jackson gets to his first lethal shot on Delaplane, non-lethal on Jackson. He just gets hit in the shoulder. And then, perfect, absolute, perfect 80 ending to the movie. Our yes. comes in and goes, what the fuck happened here? Oh, well, I'm promoting you to lieutenant. Sydney's going to go cold turkey, and now we're in love. The end. The end. <laughs> this is such a great movie. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for, the, for, my, for my final thoughts. <laughs> it is really good. And I, t- I mentioned this is, there's three scenes where they miss all the storyline, and they just cram it all into these yep. three scenes. But you're kind of okay with it because all the other scenes are so much fun that you don't want to lose anything mm-hmm. else to get more backstory. Yeah, also I feel like yeah, it's like it, every other action movie in the 80s. Please tell me where the where the good storyline. Look, listen, I like Tango and Cash. It's very entertaining. But where is the believable good storyline in that? Oh wait, there isn't. <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> exactly. It's just one of those movies where it's just action and the plot doesn't really matter. Like, you just kind of accept that, like, okay, Craig T. Nelson's a bad guy, because he kind of looks like a bad guy. Like, that's all I need. That's all I need. <laughs> oh, he knows karate? Got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Recent interviews have made it easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get too far into our final thoughts, let's go talk about this music, because this music is stacked. If it's got a stacked cast, and it hits all the notes about an 80s action movie, of course it's going to have a stacked music. 
So let's go break it down. All right, John, like I mentioned, this music section is stacked. And I know there's, there's got to be more than even what I heard because I can't hear shit. So <laughs> I'm interested to know what I missed in music. What do you got for us this week? So this week, before we get started, I just want to mention something from music from last week. So we talked about Rick's Draw from Attitude and Attitude Adjustment. Well, Rick Stroll, who is also a famous techie now, announced, guys, that the band's getting back together and they're going to be called Antitrust and they have an album called Guilty. Guys, go out and check out this album. I'm going to do a little victory lap because I just happened to do my segment last week and I'm not saying I had anything to do <laughs> with the band getting back together, but I totally did. And guys, I'm an influencer now. My music <laughs> segment is 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 making things happen. People are gonna want to be in my segment. I, I'm just saying. You, you're welcome, Antitrust, and everyone, go out and check out their album, Guilty. So it sounds like it's gonna be an awesome album. Go check it out. As John mentioned, it's a mix of attitude and attitude adjustment that they were able to get together and make this album. Rick Stroll posted it on a Twitter. That's how I found it. I also went to the website. I bought the CD. So coming in, I don't know, about a week, I'm going to have my hands on the real CD and a pack of stickers from the, from the new yeah. band. I bought it. I put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to listen to it. I think it's great that they got back together and that they're making some more music. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to where you can go see the album and, and it for sale. And then I'll look to see if it's available on any streaming services. So if people want to listen to it, they can do that too. And the last thing I'll say is that if you want to know what kind of music it is, Attitude came out of the same scene in that San Francisco, Oakland metal scene that Metallica and other bands came out of. And so if you're the one of those people that think like the best Metallica stuff happened from Ride the Lightning and before... You'll love Attitude and Antitrust. Yes. So go check them out. Please go check them out. It's, it's just, it's awesome that they got back together. It's also awesome, and for us that are getting older now, it's awesome for yeah. when people who are like over 40 still get their, they get their band back together, they find their passion again, and they go do that stuff again, because a lot of times that stuff just like comes dust in the wind. <laughs> 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 I just love hearing about people who get their stuff, uh, they find yeah. their passion again, and they, they get back to being creative. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm totally with you, and that's why I want people to go check them out. Let's get to the actual music. The music, it was like a double CD, guys. Like, it was massive. They recorded on both sides of the cassette tape. <laughs> it was like 13 songs. Now, three of the songs were Vanity songs, and I have talked about Vanity plenty tonight. I have also mentioned her plenty in previous podcasts, so I'm not going to go on about it. I mentioned her in, even in guest stars. The only thing I'll say is that Paula Abdul apparently choreographed all the dancing in this film, including Vanity's little club scene. So, we have that. The movie has, every, has everything. everything. Even Paula Abdul. Outside of the three Vanity songs, we have He Turned Me Out by the Pointer Sisters. Again, I'm not going to go on too much about the Pointer Sisters. I've mentioned them in previous music segments, and they are still going. So, and I, I believe they're on to the next set of Pointer Sisters. Still rolling. <laughs> so, the next song is Vesti La Guiba. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's Italian. <laughs> it's by Ruggiero Leon Cavallo. <laughs> it gets worse. Yes. So, and apparently... He was an Italian opera composer from 1857 to 1919, uh, or he lived from 1857 to 1919 in Italy. He had an awesome mustache, and he's known for the opera <laughs> Pagliacci. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is why he's probably got the funny mustache. I'm just saying. <laughs> Our next song, because there's so many songs, these aren't going to be, I'm not going to go into depth with anybody. We're just going to do quick hitters, guys. So the next song is. Action Jackson by Madam X. Madam X is a glam metal band formed by sisters Maxine and Roxy Petrucci. Now, this is going to be a theme, guys, with sisters and siblings uh, throughout the rest of our music. This band, Madam X, was glam metal. And do look up a picture of them. Like, totally 90s hair glam metal band. Nice. Like, awesome. And... This, they did this song, Action Jackson, for Slap Me One Records. <laughs> 
and I'm going to continue talking and uh, mentioning some of the producer names too. So this is just a whole producer episode. Um, our next song is Protect and Serve. It's by West Coast Posse, which is an old school rap group, but I'm not exactly sure. There's not a ton about them. There was a couple CDs called West Coast Posse on Spotify. But outside of that, I don't know a whole lot about them, except that the song was written by Stevie No Wonder Sal- Salas, <laughs> Pee Wee Jam, and MC Jam. So that must have been the most awesome West Coast uh, rap group ever. Pee Wee Jam and MC Jam. <laughs> I didn't really have a whole lot to go on for them. But our next song, Keeping Good Lovin' by Sister Sledge, goes back to our sibling group. It's a vocal group consisting of four sisters. Kathy, Debbie, Joni, Kim, and Kim Sledge. They were formed in 1971 from in Philadelphia. And uh, they made some international disco hits that no one listens to anymore. I didn't realize that's why their name was that. Just their sledge because they're four their sisters. Their last name yeah. is... Yeah, they're all four sisters. And their last name is actually Sledge. Our next song is Lover's Celebration by Sky. And this was for Alligator Bit Him Productions. <laughs> they are a funk disco band known for the song Call Me. They were formed in 1981 and they have had a bazillion past members. So I'm not even going to bother trying to name any of them. Our next song is Funky Broadway by Wilson Pickett. He's a U.S. singer-songwriter with 50 songs that made it onto the R&B charts. Hits like Mustang Sally. He would co-wrote In the Midnight Hour and the song Land of a Thousand Dances and a bunch more. I love the song Mustang Sally. I, I prefer the uh, Buddy Guy version of it. A little more bluesy. Moving on. Back to the siblings. That'll be the day by the Newson Brothers. That'll be the day must have been a cover because it was written by Norman Perry, Buddy Holly, and Jerry Allison. So and none of them were in that, obviously. Instead, the Newton brothers are six real brothers of a family of ten brothers. Damn. Can you imagine that? I also know. It's... Ten boys? No. <laughs> yeah, no girls. All ten boys. I go looking for the Newton brothers, and I can't find anything. They don't have a Wikipedia, but they have a Mormon wiki. <laughs> Guys, there's a Mormon Wikipedia. I didn't even know. There's go to mormonwiki.com. So, according to Mormon Wikipedia, their band is called Six, not the Newton Brothers anymore. They're now known as Six. They're a vocal group of six brothers, Barry, Kevin, Lynn, Jack, and Owen, and Curtis Newton. They perform in Branson, Missouri, and uh, oh, all over the place. <laughs> they got their first exposure on the Dottie and Marie show in 1978, and then they finally hit it big after doing regular gigs at local clubs. They began to perform in 1988 at Disney's Blast to the Past. And that got them a st- in this movie. Because it's 1988 when this movie came out. So, like, their big break went from Disneyland to in this movie. From 1988 to 95, it took them another seven years before they were able to fully support themselves as professional musicians. But since 98, they've been doing cruise lines. They do all kinds. I'm sure they've performed at Disney a bunch more. Branson, obviously Branson. They probably are the undercard for Donnie or Marie or whoever's touring. They were awarded Branson's Best New Show in 2006 and Best Show of 2008-9. So our last song in music... For the Love of Money by Levert. Levert is a band formed of brothers Gerald and Sean Levert and their friend Mark Gordon. They were formed in 1988 in Cleveland, Ohio, and they are the sons of Eddie Levert of the OJs, Hmm. who are an old Motown band. Yeah, unfortunately for them, even though they had a ton of success during their musical career, Things did not end well. Gerald died in 06 of a heart attack due to an accidental OD of prescription drugs, whereas Sean died in 08 while serving time for not paying child support. So, yeah, not great. There's your music, full of sibling drama. (laughs) There you guys go. There's your music. This went exactly the way that I hoped it would, which is, uh, there's a lot of music. (laughs) We're going to go, listen, we're going on a journey. I mean, come yeah, on. How would you go. think a Mormon group would be in Action Jackson somewhere? 
How are I those, had no idea. How are those two connected? What's weird? What's weird is like five or six of the bands they chose were like brother and sister groups. Like I don't get why the family theme carried through all of music. Like, why did they just randomly choose all those songs? Because it's not like they were all similar bands. Some of them were disco, some of them were rock, some of them were vocals. The person who put together the music, that's Zachy. Like, hey, I have a fun idea. Let's make them all siblings. <laughs> yeah. I want to say if anyone out there has a West Coast Posse CD or knows what happened to Pee Wee Jam and MC Jam, I'd like to know. <laughs> And make sure you go out and check out Antitrust's new album, Guilty. Yes. That's your music. All right. Let's go give our final thoughts on Action Jackson. I have a feeling this is we're all going to be on the same page here. So let's give our final thoughts. All right, Molson. How about you start us off this week? What are your final thoughts on Action Jackson? I love this movie. I love Carl Weathers. I love Action Jackson. What's not to say? It's got a cheesy storyline. Now, I mean, I actually really love this movie because... If you think about it, this is one of the lone, not the lone, but one of the few movies that's action movies where it's got a black main character. And I think they do a really good job of including a lot of like what would have been side character actors too in this. So it's got a wide range of people who you would have never mm -hmm. seen before. And then to put them all, I, I know they're in like Die Hard and whatever, like the Goonies and stuff like that, but well, to put them all in one movie together is a really big deal. And to also include the the cast is stacked with older actors too, right? Like the a lot of the older actors in there were very popular and it's stacked with them and they were side characters too. So there's lots of good people in it. I mean, I know the storyline is kind of lacking in detail, but I think it's okay because it has fun and it's zany and it's got some comedy and you get the big explosion in, like John said, the people die in these big fantastic ways. I mean, there's like an invisible army that goes around and kills people, but they have giant mullets. They're not actually, <laughs> they're not actually invisible. <laughs> and it's Carl Weathers. Like, please give me all of Carl Weathers. Anything Carl Weathers does, I'm going to be there. I'm going to watch it. I'm, I'm there. I'm there for Carl Weathers. John, what are your final thoughts? So uh, I, I want to touch on, I agree with Melissa, not just black male lead. When was the last time he's paired with Vanity, a black female? Exactly. When was the last time a female or a black guy wasn't paired with a white guy. I love this movie. This movie is just so... I had not watched it in a long time up into watching it again. And when I watched it, I just remembered every reason why I love it. Because it is. It's very Tango and Cash. Like, the plot line doesn't matter at all. It's just fun, action. You just have fun. Every scene through the whole movie, guys are blowing up, cars are exploding for no reason. But it doesn't matter because it's just fun. I always love Vanity and I... And, of course, Apollo. I love Apollo. Yeah, it's just a fantastic movie from beginning to end and just with everything. And I think it just encompasses everything that we do, the podcast, for these movies. You know, it's, it, it's a great 80s action movie. It has all of the 80s tropes in it. It's got everything that we love. And it's it stars Carl Weathers and Vanity, two of our favorite people. I, I'm glad we were able to get it into this season. I will pair it. Everything that you two have said, that's what makes this movie great, is that it's so fun. It's got action, it's got some zany comedy. They're able to poke fun at themselves a little bit, too, throughout the entire movie. So it's just fun. And that's what is fun about 80s action, is that they were willing to not take themselves so seriously. Not like now, which is Sky Portal opens mm -hmm. an entire American city is destroyed. And then the only way to fix it is to go through time and stop the Sky Portal. It's not as big of a uh -huh. problem. It's not as dire. It's, it's They're willing to not take themselves so seriously. So that does make it so much fun. And it is really fun. And I really like this movie. We probably watch it every couple of years, once a year, maybe a, a, every couple of years. So just remind it all the time about how much fun it is. I am going to bring up something controversial for the room right here, which is I don't think it fits our theme because I think she's a damsel in distress and he's protecting her. But I understand that I am wrong and stupid. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're wrong about this. Yes, clearly. <laughs> I mean, me and John went out to, went on to point out all the ways she helps him and she actually helps him lure people uh -huh. in and help save him, but yet she's still just a damn bull in distress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if it was up to Dominic, we'd have a ball as Apollo Creed. So. <laughs> His balls would be in a jar. Come on. <laughs> 
Come on. I just want to say that I have a sneaking suspicion right. that when we get to the end of the season, then we're picking our best sidekicks, that Ed is going to be higher on my list than Vanity. And it hurts me to say that because I love Vanity. But <laughs> Ed, Ed is probably the better partner in the scenario. Uh, actually, I'm probably going to go with D. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, we all know she's better than Psych, so there's that. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say about this movie is that uh, it was supposed to be a part of a franchise, and it never did. And I'm kind of disappointed it was. Not this would have been a great that franchise, <laughs> like because you know we got the lethal weapons, we got the diehards, and I think actually Jackson could have fit that. So it's unfortunate we never got that. I agree. Yeah, I wish we would have got more Action Jackson. I think they're still an opportunity now based on how many remakes and reboots and stuff that there are right now that we could revisit mm -hmm. it with the older action Jackson and a, a passing of the torch say, but anyways, never give up hope is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Come on, Carl, make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Meet you at Burger King and discuss it. <laughs> He's not going to free meal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. Come on, email us. Let us know what you think about Craig T. Nelson's karate abilities. <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> you think, did you think for one minute that we were going to get through an episode that wasn't going to be any karate? Boom. Craig T. Nelson is the man's <laughs> name. <laughs> he knows his karate. <laughs> He's no William Pickles, but <laughs> you don't have to do for this movie. Oh, my God. I just remembered. <laughs> Mr. We're, William Pickle. Reminder, people, that you need to subscribe to our newsletter because in that newsletter, there is a video of the yes. real William Pickles on his own TV show doing an interview with Jalal Mary. It's real, 100% real. Yes. You've got to subscribe to our newsletter in order to be able to see that. To subscribe to the newsletter, go to the website, goalwiththeheat.com, or go to gwth.us slash newsletter. That's our short URL. Get it? Go with the heat. gwth.us slash newsletter, or go to the website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can subscribe to the newsletter, and you will see that amazing video of the real Bill Pickles, who is the actor that's in <laughs> yes. Tiger Claws, yes. the real guy doing an interview, a real interview with Jalal. Yes, the person who funded that movie. <laughs> we would also love your support. To support us, step number one, go to your podcast or platform of choice and leave us a review. Give us five stars. That'll help other people find the show. That'll help let us know that people love us. But uh, more importantly, it'll let people know that mm -hmm. the other people like this show, they'll be willing to give it a chance. But don't write a review. No one ever mm -hmm. reads the reviews. No one, no one reads them. So instead, I want you to write a short story about how William Pickles trained Craig T. Nelson for karate <laughs> in Action Jackson. I want you to merge those two universes together. And don't forget, people, I'm an influencer now. <laughs> Support step number two, we want you to go find Rick Strahl on Twitter. I'm going to leave a link in our show notes on how you can do that. I want you to tweet at him and let him know that you heard about him on the Go With The Heat podcast and that you're buying the out that their, their new album that they just released, just like me. I for real bought that album. We want you to go to Rick Strahl, let him know that you heard about the album here on Go With The Heat and that you're buying his album. Please do it. He needs the support. Support step number three. After you're done giving Rick Stroll money, give us money. Go to the website. Go find our Patreon, our PayPal, our Venmo, or Square Cash, and send us some money. If you're going to spend $10, $12 on an album from Rick Stroll, why can't you send us $10, $12? No, just send it to us, and then we'll go buy more albums. <laughs> I'm telling you guys. Send us some cash. Let me know what your band is. I'll pimp it in music, and you guys will be huge in no time. <laughs> I think that's a bribe. Listen, that is. <laughs> we are huge in Australia. <laughs> you send us your music. We will make you huge in Australia. <laughs> Only one part yes. of Australia, though. Yes. <laughs> Only one that region, will, really. But <laughs> You will make so many didgeridoos. <laughs> Go to that website and find all the ways to contact us and support us. Go to heat.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. Bye.